All right, joining us to discuss the cold front that has made landfall in the country is Dr. Dion Blanche, World Bank Weather and Climate Science Scientist and Dr. Peter Johnson, UCT Climate Scientist. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on this very cold evening. Let's start with you, Dr. Ter Blanche. So whenever we experience extreme weather, we're tempted to ask how much of it can be attributed to human-induced climate change. Your views on just the reasons behind the extreme cold and wet weather we're experiencing? Okay, we, we live in South Africa, which is known for quite a variable climate. And uh, so we do expect these seasons not all to be the same and the weather systems also to vary quite a lot. But it's like going down a, a stream, down a mountain in a valley where there's rapids and turbulence in a little boat. And uh, as the stream grows stronger and stronger, there will be bigger rapids and more uh, turbulence and it becomes more dangerous as you go down the river. And this is exactly what the signal of climate change is below the climate variability that we experience from day to day and from season to season. So what we will see in future is more of these type of extreme events and they will become even more extreme into the future. So there's definitely a climate change signal in this, but of course we has always had uh, a variability in our climate. Mm -hmm. So there's no reversing, but one assumes that we can slow the progression thereof. Yeah, but that would take the international community to really uh, work together, as was agreed in Paris in uh, the climate negotiations. And the big issue is that we need to curb our releases of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. There's a slow warming uh, of the whole Earth system. Most of the heat is stored in the oceans, and the oceans have got a very long life uh, memory. But these greenhouse gases, especially CO2, have got a very long lifetime in the atmosphere of hundreds or thousands of years. So even pollution uh, CO2 that was released in the previous century are still with us. And so it's accumulating and getting more every year as we add to that. So it's a really serious thing. Mm -hmm. Now, we've noted, Doctor, that the hottest hit areas are always the coastal ones. Your Western Cape, Eastern Cape, Case 10. Why exactly is this? Well, in these regions, especially in the Western Cape, we, we have a very complex topography as well. So as weather systems approaches the land, uh, the topography as is lifted, it uh, enhances the rainfall that flows. And of course, the winds are always stronger closer to the oceans. And so therefore, these ocean areas also experience stronger winds than we would, for example, have over the interior. Then, of course, we have... Uh, waves and uh, we've seen uh, huge waves i'm in the overstrand area and we could see waves up nine meters uh, in the vicinity and we also had spring tide the past weekend so the high tide is especially high and so you have a storm surge that comes with this uh, very intense system and low pressure that uh, accompanies the uh, cold front system mm -hmm. now doctor there are always those experts or commentators that would say Let's not be alarmist and blame everything on climate change. This is normal weather conditions and especially around this time of the year. What would you say to those that say we're being alarmist and attempting to blame everything on climate change? Well, I think in South Africa, we've got the very specific situation that we have many people living in informal settlements. And so we are even vulnerable to the day to day weather in our country without even thinking about climate change. So, as I've always said, the best way to prepare for a changing climate is to learn to live with today's weather. And uh, we really battle to do that already. And as these things become more intense and more frequent, it will become a challenge. So, it's really a high priority, especially for local government, because they are at the coalface uh, dealing with these issues. And I see even in the Western Cape, uh, the uh, local municipalities and districts municipalities are really stretched at the moment to try and deal with the situation. Mm, I believe we have Dr. Johnston on the line. Good evening, Doctor. Just to get your views, we're currently discussing what we can attribute this inclement weather to. It's become more extreme as the years progress. Can we really say a part of it is due to human-induced climate change? Well, that's a little difficult to do that, as, as uh, Dr. Blanche has said, because we have this natural variability, and it's not unheard of to have cold temperatures like this um, from time to time. Uh, the warning is, though, always has been that climate models are suggesting that our weather is going to be more extreme and we can affect more heavy rainfall events. And this is what we've seen. Um, we had Heritage Day last year. We've had uh, June last year and now 
this weekend or this week where we've had over 100 millimeters, which is almost a month's worth of rain in a few days. And the climate change signal is suggesting exactly that. But we can't say specifically that this event is due to climate change. But we can say that it's more likely that events like this are going to happen more frequently in the future. And we need to learn from these and be prepared. Mm-hmm. So essentially, <clears throat> climate change may be causing it. Climate change is real. This is part of uh, the variable system. Um, we must be get used to this sort of thing, and in the future we're probably going to have it more often. Mm-hmm. You say we need to get prepared. How do we go about doing this? Well, all the models have suggested certain trends. Now, some of them are very uncertain, but some of them are quite clear. For example, everywhere is going to get warmer. So we need to look at the sectors that are vulnerable. We need to find out where the vulnerabilities are. For example, buildings in summer, agriculture in summer are very susceptible to heat. So if we're going to have extremely hot days, we've got to look at ways of countering that. What are we going to do to survive when we have those very, very hot days? Similarly, if we have days of very, very high rainfall, are we, is our drainage system ready? Are we prepared for these kind of flooding events? Or are we just going to look at it and say, well, we couldn't help it. It was nature. We've got to look at the future, look at the models, speak to scientists, speak to decision makers, and come to some sort of agreement of the kind of things that we can do when these events happen. And it's not, it's, it's not just saying, well, we can't do anything about climate change. There are plenty of things we can do. Even if we can't prevent climate change in the near future, certainly we can be prepared for events like this. And you can't stop a river from overflowing its banks if the river is kept clean and if the river channel is clear. But if the river channel is blocked, if the drains are blocked, if people are living in areas with high water tables, then one could really say, well, that could have been prevented. And that's really the, that's really the action of the lesson we have to learn. Mm-hmm. Dr. Treblanche, do you get a sense that government is moving with the necessary speed to perhaps get the infrastructure that can withstand the adverse weather that we expect soon? No, I think we are always slightly behind the curve. And uh, that really is a wake-up call that we really exactly, as Peter said, need to look at infrastructure, but also look at the systems and the relationships between the different government departments so that uh, we do our city planning and the planning of settlements better, but also what the Weather Service has actually been doing a fairly good job in South Africa is building this relationship with the disaster management authorities so that we become more proactive than rather reactive dealing after the fact with with issues. So I think there's still a lot of work to do uh, over many of the government departments. Mm -hmm. Which is quite unfortunate, honestly, because we've had a number of events, particularly in KwaZulu-Natal of late. But what government now is being commended for is perhaps the response to deal with it after the fact, where they come in, they assist the displaced, they house them, etc. Yeah, I think uh, that's always important to deal with uh, the humanity fact after the fact. But uh, I think... uh, really invest in more more proactive action and being better prepared will go a long way to uh, alleviate the effects of such disasters. Mm -hmm. Dr. Johnson, do you get a sense that government, though, has appetite to involve more of the academics in their more comprehensive plan to deal with this issue in future? Yes, I think so. I mean, most of the big cities have got climate change um, legislation, have got climate change action plans, have got adaptation plans and have got committees that involve scientists and practitioners alike. So I think we certainly do have the blueprint for, for enacting the certain changes and getting used to the kind of adaptations we require. But it does still require the will of the local government and the provincial governments and the funding to be able to implement those. And very often there's a tension between certain priorities and other priorities. And, and this is always going to happen. There just isn't enough money to go around. But when we look at how much money is spent on fixing up these disasters, that's very, very much, much more than it would take to try and prevent them by improving the infrastructure. And improving infrastructure once, it's improved for a lifetime. If you try and respond, then you're only responding to each event as it happens. Mm, A very important point that you put across there. Thank you very much to the both of you gentlemen.